morning, everybody, and welcome to Mills and Reeves' in-house in focus session. Uh, this morning, as you know, we're going to be having a brief look um, at some topics which are hopefully relevant in the current COVID pandemic and lockdown. Uh, I'm going to be looking briefly at force majeure and frustration, and my colleague Mark Davison is going to be looking at arbitration. Just to introduce ourselves, I'm Simon Petley. Those who don't know me, I'm a partner in the disputes team at Mills and Reeve. Over to Mark. Hi, and yes, yeah, so I'm Mark Davison. I'm the head of international arbitration here at Mills and Reeve, based in our London office. Excellent. So good morning, everyone. And uh, we're up to about well, 164 participants so far, which is fabulous. Thank you so much for, for spending the time to um, join us. Um, as we go through today's talk, of course, we would love to have questions. If I could ask you, please, to do all those questions via the Q&A function, um, and then we will deal with them all at the end. Uh, I've tried in previous seminars to have a go at answering questions as we go and just ended up getting a bit confused, which is a sign of my age, I think. So we'll, we'll leave it to the end. So if you do ask a question, if you could be as specific as possible, which slide you were referring to or which point you were trying to make, because um, just think we'll be reading it completely out of context and half an hour later and, and just give, give us a chance and we'll do our best to answer any questions you have. Um, so, uh, as we said slightly earlier, someone asked, uh, and it has been said, we are recording this session. It will be available afterwards, as will the slides. Ask us a question in the Q&A box, and there will be at least one poll uh, during the course of this talk, certainly in mine. I don't know if Mark's planning to do a poll, so uh, please do answer that when the time of Mark's not answering a poll. There is one poll, so it will be desperately exciting when it happens. Um, you're all at home, I'm assuming, or most of you are at home. No fire drills, nothing to happen if a fire alarm goes off. Hope you've got your own coffee as we have. So let's get cracking. So looking at force majeure and frustration then, we're gonna be just reviewing these concepts very briefly. I'm gonna consider hopefully how useful they are in practice. There will be one um, case study to have a look at and that's where the poll comes in. And we'll have a look at a few tips for contract issues that may be arising now during lockdown. So I thought we'd deal with frustration first. So there's no contractual causes to look at here. This is a common law doctrine that's been developed by judges over many, many years. Um, what counts as a potentially frustrating event in a contract then? Well, generally speaking, it's an event which occurs after the contract has been formed, is so fundamental, it's regarded by the law as going to the root of the contract, and it's entirely beyond what the parties contemplated at the time they entered into it. It's not due to either party's fault, and it renders further performance impossible, illegal, or so radically different from what was contemplated that the contract effectively becomes a nullity. Um, and what sort of things have in the past been held to be frustrating events? Well, destruction, by fire or other cause of the subject matter of the contract. There are cases from the, the 1860s, which are, are still good law there. I mean, for example, on, if you see on the shelf behind me, there's a Union Jack Dalek. Now, if you assume that that Union Jack Dalek is not a piece of mass produced plastic tap, but is in fact a unique artwork designed by Damien Hurst, and I contractor sell it to you, if before the date of performance of the contract, that Dalek is destroyed by fire, um, I, the contract just simply can't be performed. It, it, it has to be come to an end. I cannot perform the contract whether you sue me for specific performance or, or, or anything else. So that's the sort of thing where the actual subject matter is, is gone completely. Um, other things might be, for example, where something that was legal becomes illegal. So if war is declared against a country, then an export contract that you had beforehand may be rendered illegal by the declaration of war. And that sort of thing has been held to be a frustrating event. But perhaps more instructive is to look at where uh, frustration hasn't been held to occur. Um, for example, where the parties have made provision for what happens for a particular event, then it's not frustrated if you've dealt with it in the contract. Where the alleged frustrating event should have been seen by the parties, that's not frustrating. Where you can perform the contract in some other form, um, crucially where a contract is merely more expensive to perform, that's been held not to be frustrating and that often goes to the root of these queries when we're asked about them, when people think, is this frustrated? Pray not, it's just uh, more expensive for you now. Um, 
and changes in economic conditions or exchange rates or those things, those won't frustrate a contract. And as I say, nor will an event that was already apparent when a contract was made. Now, an, an epidemic related example is uh, Li Ching Wing and Huan Yi Zhong. I'm sure my pronunciation is dreadful there. This was a Hong Kong case, and this came up during the SARS pandemic, um, early 2000s, and a tenant of premises was subject to a form of government regulation order that meant the premises couldn't be occupied for a period of 10 days or so. And they said, well, the, the contract is frustrated. I can't, you know, um, I, I can't go in and, and use the premises. The court said, no, that 10 days was insignificant in the context of the two years of the lease. And while SARS was arguably the sort of unforeseeable event that could be frustrating, um, it wasn't here because that occurrence didn't so radically change the contract between the parties. If it had been for a year, maybe it would have done, but it was only for 10 days. So these things are questions of, of fact and degree. Now, that's not to say that the epidemics and pandemics can't be frustrating events. Um, no doubt they can, if that renders performance um, impossible or, or radically different. I mean, I've, I've spoken to uh, lawyers at performing arts venues who were set up to you know, put on shows and concerts and when then the pandemic hit and then you can't you can't go into those buildings clearly uh, had it not been dealt with in other ways you, there would have been a very very strong argument for saying that contract was clearly frustrated you could not put on a a concert or an opera or whatever at that stage now for contracts being made now the current pandemic is much less likely to give rise to uh, being seen as a frustrating event because it's in everyone's contemplation. So if you make a contract now and then plans are thrown into disarray by a second wave of COVID over the winter, I think you'd find it tough to say that was a frustrating event because that's the sort of thing which might be expected to be in people's minds. So if you want to deal with those sorts of things, that possibility occurring, you want to deal with those specifically in the contracts you're, you're making now. So if you have a, a frustrating event, what are the consequences? Well, at common law, uh, if a contract is frustrated, it's automatically dis discharged and the parties are excused from all future obligations. So it's brought to an end going forwards, but it's not rescinded from the start. So if you have incurred obligations by the time the frustrating event occurs, you were due to make a payment, you're still liable to, to make that payment because that was an obligation that arose before the event. And at common law, losses lie where they fall. Um, so even if you had substantially paid for uh, something but got no benefit from it, that's that's tough uh, un under the basic common law doctrine. Now, it might be possible in cases of total failure of consideration to bring some sort of restitution claim. You might not be without a remedy, but it's clearly an, uh, that basic common law position is an unsatisfactory one. Um, however, there is another thing which would save most contracts entered into by uh, the organisation that you represent, and that's the Law Reform Frustrated Contracts Act, which applies to most commercial contracts unless excluded and certain types are, but it will cover most commercial contracts. And that says money paid before the frustrating event can be recovered uh, and money due before the frustrating event can be claimed. Um, but if it's not, sorry, money paid before which was due to be paid before the frustrating event, uh, but has not been paid, ceases to be payable. Uh, but a party who has incurred expense is permitted, if the court thinks fit, to retain an appropriate amount of value. So say it's a, I pay by instalments, I've paid a deposit of £50,000 um, uh, and I've not received the benefit of the contract. So you'd have to give the money back, but you've done £25,000 worth of work. You can deduct that £25,000. Um, and the court can require a party who's gained a valuable benefit under the contract before the uh, frustrating event to pay a just sum for it, whether anything was strictly paid or payable under the terms of the contract. So under this act, um, provision is made in a, a set way as to what the consequences might be, um, but it wouldn't always be appropriate for your type of contract. So as with all these things, it is far better if you are worried about such matters to uh, think about them and think about what the consequences ought to be and put that into your contract. Um, it is possible to contract out of uh, that act, so consider if you're doing contracts now whether you'd be more or less likely to want to rely on the doctrine of frustration and, and these implications and so uh, think about think about those. Uh, if you're a supplier, for example, you might be happier contracting out so you won't have to give 
refunds and debts are still payable and things like that. If you're the customer, you, you may take a different view. So as with everything, it's always best to deal with things in contract. So that's very quickly, uh, frustration. Force majeure. <coughs> well, what's it mean? Literally, it means superior force. And what is the concept of force majeure in English law? Well, this is a very easy one to answer. There is no concept of force majeure in English law. Compared to some other jurisdictions, the French Civil Code has uh, force majeure um, provisions dealing with these sorts of situations, but not in English law. In English law, it is purely a matter of contract between the parties. Whether a force majeure event occurs depends on what you've drafted in your contract as to what that might mean. Um, and if there's no force majeure clause, there's no contractual provision for all this stuff, and you can't rely on frustration, well, you may be in a contract that you can't perform and you may be liable for damages. Um, so it's it's important that, that you do think about considering these things. Um, and it's all about the drafting, of course. So there can easily be situations where you've got a clause, but it doesn't actually cover your situation. And, and as I said before, I've been talking to a lawyer at um, a performing arts venue when the pandemic hit and they would be due to put on productions in the coming weeks and months. And they had force majeure provisions in their contract, but on review, the lawyer told me that in fact they didn't really deal at all appropriately with the sorts of contracts they had and what the consequences might be. In fact, they dealt with everything in a very amicable way and everyone was pulling together, which is great. But even though they had the clauses, they would, someone had just stuck in some boilerplate at, at one stage and hadn't actually thought about that particular contract. Well, <coughs> here's an example clause. I'm not going to read it out. But, but typically, as you'll know, there'll often be a shopping list of unpredictable disaster events and plus often some kind of catch-all phrase. And here the catch-all is near the start, uh, acts beyond the party's reasonable control. Uh, and this clause provides that neither party is liable for delays or uh, failures resulting from the occurrences specified by the clause. I'm not advocating this as, as an appropriate clause, but this is just a, a typical example. So if you have to look at a contract and you have to look at this, uh, and you're considering whether something has been triggered by the pandemic. Um, first, you've got to just look at whether coronavirus, the epidemic, falls within the scope of the clause. It may specifically refer to epidemics and pandemics, in which case, uh, great, then it's likely to cover COVID. But if it doesn't, it may depend on some of that catch-all wording. And sometimes I've been looking with clients at um, force majeure clauses which refer to biological contamination and wondering whether we can argue that COVID comes within that. I mean, I think we concluded there it, it was certainly biological, but it's not contamination as that word was, was commonly heard. So if it's not doesn't cover a pandemic, you might have to be quite creative to try and get the pandemic into it. Um, and secondly, you then have to think about why, what the clause says about the connection between the force majeure event and the reason why the party can't perform the contract. So some clauses say the force majeure event will occur if a party is prevented from, from performing its obligations. But others might say it will occur on the lesser hurdle that they have been hindered or delayed in performing their obligations. So uh, the, this may be important when you're actually looking at the reasons for why a party can't deal with things in any event. Is it actually caused by the pandemic or is it caused by earlier financial difficulties they were in or whatever it may be? So again, it's got to be very fact specific. Uh, and these clauses will usually provide that the party has got to make reasonable efforts to perform the contract before they can rely on the clause. Um, the third point is you need to consider what then is the effect. Does the clause merely suspend the party's obligations for the duration of the uh, force majeure event, or does it terminate it completely going forward? So if it's a suspension clause, uh, the party will need to, to carry on performing once lockdown has ended sufficiently and we can all go back to work, say. Um, but otherwise, you, you, you may be able to terminate. Um, if it's a termination type one, again, very frequently these clauses require parties to serve notice within a certain period of time. And I've been looking at that with a, uh, a, a sports client recently where we're all thinking, could the other party potentially be uh, able to rely on um, force majeure, thinking they probably couldn't anyway, but in any event, they'd missed the deadline and the contractual requirement. So, so any chance they had, had, had gone. Um, these clauses typically won't unwind obligations that accrued before the relevant event. And generally speaking, they'll leave it so that debts which were accrued before the event still have to be paid. And, and often then that's the key in these things, actually, what happens with obligations already con 
concerned if force majeure has occurred and the, the contract is at an end. And some people think that if the clause is silent, the court, as a matter of interpretation, may fall back on the frustrated, the frustrated contracts act and put in some of those provisions. But it's it's not at all clear. So you, you could just be left with losses falling where they like, which, again, may not be what you want at all. So the, the drafting and consideration in the context of your particular contractual arrangement is very important. Um, and in drafting them, well, don't assume that any new contracts you're drafting with a force majeure event, it won't apply to COVID related things. They, they may do. It's just important to draft it right. Um, just because the COVID pandemic is upon us and it's a sort of a known quantity doesn't necessarily mean you won't be able to rely on it for, for force majeure. The case law is clear. Force majeure um, clauses can apply to events which are already in existence at the time the contract is, is made. So if you're if you want to be able to rely on a, a COVID related um, force majeure event or you don't want the other party to be able to rely on it, you just ought to deal with that specifically in the contract. Um, so yeah, you don't, there's no rule that um, an event has to be unforeseeable at the, the time of the contract. These things can apply to foreseeable um, events. So again, going back to the, an earlier point I made, if you're the party less likely to want to rely on it, such as a, a customer, you might want to remove um, references to epidemics and pandemics and that sort of stuff in the contract. Um, or you might want to include a statement that the other party, the supplier, say, can't rely on such a clause in respect of events resulting from the pandemic or which a reasonable, reasonable supplier ought to have seen and ought to have made provision for. So, so do think about it. But if you are that supplier and you want to rely on it, well, you, you want to make it as broad as you can to ensure that unexpected quirks arising from the ongoing, ongoing pan, pandemic um, do still apply. Um, so as I say, yeah, uh, these clauses are creatures of contracts. And so what then happens depends very much on what you, you have agreed. Uh, and as I typically, they provide that obligations or enforcement for obligations is suspended or perhaps that the contract can be terminated on notice. They don't say anything about unwinding things before the uh, event, so you do need to, to think hard about that. As I mentioned earlier, restitution might be available if there's been a total failure of consideration. But again, thinking about your contract, you need to think of properly about this and don't just stick in the standard boilerplate from PLC or whatever it might, whatever it might be. So I'll move on now to the case study and all things being equal, the poll, which I'll go on to the next side. So let's assume this is based on an amalgam of, of various real things I've done. We're acting for a university, and this university has complex agreements with a third party and with various funders in relation to the provision of student accommodation. And the third party runs the accommodation. It does all the facilities management, the decoration, the repairs, all that sort of stuff. And in broad terms in this contract, the university has to pass on to the third party all rent it actually receives from students, in essence, but also it has to ensure that there is a minimum level of rental income, whatever the actual uh, rental income may be. Now, this current summer term and going into next academic year, there will be very few students, not none, but very few students living in this accommodation. And next year, Certainly, uh, even if UK students might start coming back, there will be many, many fewer overseas students. So the net result of this is there's clearly going to be a rent shortfall and a significant gap between the rents actually received to pass on to the facilities management company uh, and the, the minimum level of obligation. So here's the, the clause, uh, a force majeure event any event beyond the reasonable control of the party affected by the agreement and which prevents any of the parties from performing their obligations without prejudice to the generality force majeure includes strikes riots sabotage act of war nuclear explosion government action destruction or damage of part of the premises by fire delays called by, caused by failure of power supply or transport facilities and the lack of availability of materials no party shall be considered to be in breach or liable for any loss damage or delay as a result of the occurrence of one or more force majeure events notified to the other party well, so long as the force majeure event subsists, the obligations will be suspended, save that to the extent that they are able to comply with their obligations, uh, uh, they'll still be required to do so. So have a quick look at that, but I will now, if the technology lets me and I get it right, I will launch the poll, which is, what do you think, learned audience? Can the university rely on the force majeure clause? So have a quick think and say what you want to say, and we'll, we'll study the results at a moment. 
only about half of you who have voted now, so uh, give you another 10 seconds for anyone who desperately wants to be included in this poll to, to have their say. We're getting a good representative sample so far. Okay, then I will. We've had about two thirds of you who have voted. Thank you very much. Uh, I will end the polling now. And in the theory, I am now sharing the results. So hopefully you can see that. So in broad terms, the view in the room, two thirds of you think the university can't rely on the clause, one third think you can, uh, and which just goes to show I mean, that, that there's a clear majority of view, it's, it's still a substantial minority thinks the other way, and which just goes to show with these clauses uh, that that's often the way of it, and it's not always a straightforward answer. So I will stop sharing those results, and I will hopefully close that. Um, my view is, I'm with the majority, I'm with the no camp, I think. Um, I don't think the clause particularly helps the university. It's not prevented from making the minimum payment to the, the other party. It's just become very expensive for it to do so because it hasn't got actual student rents to, to go towards it. Um, the university wouldn't be in breach by not passing on student fees to the third party because there are no such fees to pass on. So that's not a breach of contract, but the minimum payment obligation still exists and, and the university can, can still um, meet it. So this often is the way with these things. The party who says it's got to be force majeure um, doesn't accept the fact that, that it's, just, it's just more expensive. And here, actually, the parties have thought about the particular issue. They have specifically put in the contract, basically, if there is a shortfall in rent, the university pays it. That's why there's this minimum rent payment. The whole contract is structured to put the risk of there not being enough students in on the university. The fact that nobody foresaw such a major drop off in attendance doesn't, I think, help the university. Conversely, it's possible that the facilities management provider, in respect of some of its obligations, might be able to rely on force majeure if it can't get in adequate staffing safely and therefore it has knock on effects or it can't get materials so it can't perform all its obligations under the contract they may actually be more likely to uh, successfully rely on force majeure to suspend those those obligations and it's also unclear here the, the fact that the obligations are suspended so um, you've got a minimum payment obligation okay that's suspended for four months over the summer or while the lockdown restrictions are in place or whatever it might be but that ends and then the payment obligation comes back. So again, I'm not sure it's, uh, it's desperately helpful. Um, so I always, there we are. There's, there's always a slow answer. Once you've launched a poll, it takes a while to be able to click down to the next screen. You don't, you're not interested in that. So find my final slide, tips for contract problems in lockdown. I mean, these are, these are fairly obvious and I'm sure all of you will be very familiar with these, these issues anyway be very wary of trying to rely on force majeure clauses or frustration you've got to think through really carefully what are the consequences were you to be successful in so doing and think about all the other options that might be in fact is there insurance available to somebody which might cover this i mean there's some big test cases going on at the moment as to whether various uh, insurance policies um, cover covid related losses the insurers are saying no they don't and it's you know, only accidentally that they might come within this wording. The, the customers who have bought the insurance are saying, no, no, that's not the case. Clearly it's covered. So for a number of policies, there's a very big litigation underway at the moment, which could have a big effect, uh, whatever the uh, result might be. Um, but check your contract really carefully, work on other ways to reduce your exposure. But the key thing is, as everyone is, work with your commercial partners. Um, most people realize that this is such an unexpected thing it's affecting contracts in all sorts of ways and the best result is generally achieved by talking to people working out commercial solutions with a bit of compromise on both sides as a disputes lawyer half my job is spent uh, talking to people in these situations trying to steer you away from litigation because that's nine times out of ten that's an unsatisfactory outcome and you're always looking for the least worst uh, solution commercial discussions and thinking of variations that, that might work is, is generally going to be the, the best way. So a key takeaway then I think is if you're looking at these don't rush in. I mean do take the time to think through your uh, options properly. Even though an urgent situation you may feel it needs urgent action and it will, 
even though that temptation is to act quickly, I think just thinking a few steps ahead is always the way to go. You know, there, there is likely, we think, there hasn't been yet, but there's likely to be an upswing in commercial disputes, particularly as the furlough scheme ends and all that sort of stuff happens, because businesses have been shielded from some of the adverse uh, economic effects of the pandemic thus far by the government action and the government support. If and when that comes to an end, there are going to be a lot of businesses in certain industries, definitely, which are going to be in a great deal of difficulty. And it's like a uh, musical pass the parcel. At some point, the music is going to stop and someone's going to be holding the, the liability parcel. And at that point, we think litigation will ensue. But steps you might take now uh, may help you avoid that. And certainly in contracts you're drafting now, you need to give proper thought and don't just treat force majeure as boilerplate. You, you really do need to uh, think about it in a bespoke way. So there you are, very superficial um, level look at force majeure and frustration. I'm teaching my grandma to suck eggs, I know, so uh, I'm sure you'll know all this stuff. Um, questions on the Q&A, I think some have been coming in and we'll, we'll have a look at them again. Without any further ado, I shall pass over to Mark, who's going to tell us some very interesting stuff relating to arbitration. And if he doesn't, you can sue him. Thank you, Simon. Uh, that's really interesting, actually, just the uh, the interplay between frustration and force majeure. We've had an issue for a client recently where um, the first point of call was for us to claim force majeure, and we looked at the clause, and it just wasn't going to work for the client. So we went down the frustration route. Uh, luckily, we've been able to do a, a commercial settlement. So, uh, but it is sort of important to to look at both aspects when you're uh, dealing with these issues at the moment, especially in the uh, the current circumstances. Um, so as Simon said, uh, I am going to talk to you today about arbitration. Hopefully I can get the slides to work. But it takes a couple of seconds on the basis of controlling Simon's screen. Maybe if it's not working, Simon, I might have to ask you to uh, be the slide master. Oh, there we go. Uh, so just we're going to briefly just touch on uh, what arbitration is, some tips on arbitration clauses, and just in particular, why arbitration might be of benefit to parties, uh, especially in a post-COVID and Brexit world. Uh, as Simon mentioned, uh, I think we're all expecting there'll be an uptick in disputes as the, uh, the government schemes come to an end. Uh, and uh, an arbitration might actually provide some benefit for parties uh, who are entering into commercial agreements at the moment um, going forward. Um, I appreciate the next slide is very cheesy, but it's if there is just one thing to try and as a takeaway from this session if, if, could i just plead that it please be this uh, which is just i appreciate that every time you're dra uh, drafting a dispute resolution clause it's always at the end of the contract it's always probably the last thing which is looked at but just to always have in mind if a problem occurs under the contract and you have to resort to litigation in order to enforce your rights where are you actually going to enforce any judgment or award that you get? And time and time again, we see you know, perfectly drafted English court dispute resolution clauses, and you think there's a fantastic case there for the client to vindicate their rights. But then you see that the counterparty is, for example, a Saudi counterparty with no assets based outside of the Middle East. And you, you, as a litigator, your heart just sinks because you know that the client has a, a good claim and deserves to be vindicated but you just know there's no way that you're going to be able to enforce an English judgment overseas in order to recover the assets that uh, the client it would be entitled to get under the judgment. Uh, and so really the, the, the key benefit and the key weapon in arbitration's arsenal is uh, the New York Convention 1958, which I'll come on to again shortly. So just very quickly, just into, for those that aren't really aware of arbitration or never used it, um, I mean, quite simply, all it is, it's just a private form of dispute resolution. It's just an alternative form of dispute resolution to that of the courts or you know, other ADR mechanisms. Um, in order to have a binding arbitration agreement between the parties, it has to be in writing. So you both have to agree that you refer your dispute to arbitration. Uh, but the, the other benefit of arbitration is it leads to binding decisions. It's not like mediation where... Uh, it might not necessarily lead to, uh, even if you have a mediator decision or adjudication decision, uh, there might be issues about the, uh, the binding validity of uh, the decision which has been made. In arbitration, the, uh, the award is binding on the parties. It can be appealed to the courts, but usually on limited exceptions, um, such as 
uh, an issue of manifest error, such as if there is uh, evidence of a conflict with the arbitrator, for example, or on uh, issues of law, although parties can actually contract out of the ability to appeal on issues of law. Just in terms of just some of the advantages of arbitration over court litigation, I uh, appreciate I might, many of you might be aware of these already and that I'm teaching grandma to suck eggs, as Simon said before. Um, and the key one is enforcement. Um, the New York Convention, uh, it's a multilateral treaty. Uh, there's currently over 160 states around the world which are signed up to the New York Convention. I think it was the Republic of Tonga which signed up last month. Uh, you'll be pretty hard pushed to find a jurisdiction uh, that you may deal with um, which isn't a member of the New York Convention. And what the New York Convention provides for is uh, reciprocal enforcement of awards in uh, signatory states. There's no similar regime for English court judgments. Uh, probably the widest regime we have is the Brussels recast regulation, um, which allows for the automatic enforcement of English court judgments in Europe and vice versa. But obviously post Brexit uh, and post the end of the transitional arrangement, uh, which ends on the 31st of December 2020, uh, will fall out of the Brussels recast regime. And I'll come on to talk about the, uh, the flux that we're in uh, in respect of that um, shortly, just about where we're going in a post Brexit world. Um, another key advantage of arbitration is confidentiality. Um, so it's both as to the process and to the documents produced. Uh, court litigation is usually, the mantra behind court litigation is that it's held in public. Um, there are limited circumstances where you can get a hearing heard in private, uh, but you will be sort of fairly um, hard pushed to try and get that. Uh, you can imagine what sort of Johnny Depp and Amber Heard are going through at the moment with their private lives being washed through the press. Uh, it's very much the case that if you're involved in court litigation, then the, uh, the dirty laundry is out there for the public to see. Um, Another advantage of arbitration I always think is a key benefit is the fact that the parties get to appoint the tribunal and that means that you can effectively ensure that you've got skilled decision makers that are experts in your particular sector uh, determining your dispute. I think just from a practical example, the best way that I've seen a tribunal make up for this was I was involved in a, um, an arbitration about a, the construction of a sports stadium in the Middle East that was under a Middle East system of law. And so as our arbitrator, we picked an Egyptian lawyer on the basis that most Middle East civil codes are based on the Egyptian civil code. The other side picked a quantity surveyor as their arbitrator. And then as the chairman for the tribunal, we had an English construction QC. And you could just see the dynamic and the interplay between the tribunal worked really well on the basis that there was an issue of Middle East civil law that went to the, uh, the, the Egyptian arbitrator. If it was a technical aspect about the construction of the project, then that went to the, you could see that the arbitrators turned to the QS. And then you have this construction QC um, who, uh, sort of with his wealth of expertise, managed the process and was able to um, effectively ensure that um, sort of managed both arbitrators. So that just works really well, and that's how it works in, in practice. And um, sometimes with the court, it can be slightly potluck, especially if you've got something which is very uh, niche and quite sector sector specific, uh, you might not necessarily have a particular expert in that uh, area if you use the uh, if you go to court. Uh, another advantage of arbitration over court litigation is that if you structure it properly uh, in advance, it can actually be a speedy way to resolve disputes, and it can be a very flexible way to resolve disputes. Um, you know, arbitration it's a creature of contract; it's a party led process. Um, so parties can choose how they want the proceedings to be conducted. So if you want to have uh, an expedited dispute resolution mechanism, you can agree that up front within the contract. I have seen contracts that have specified that disputes be resolved within four weeks. It's a slight nightmare for the litigators and for in-house counsel, but for the commercial people, they tend to be quite happy with that on the basis that they um, there's no uncertainty uh, after the, the sort of the period of expiry, the four weeks, because they know what the decision is. Um, some arbitral rules actually already provide for automatic expedited processes there. Uh, I've just specified the ICC rules there as an example. Um, technolo technology within arbitration and particular video technology. So arbitration has been an early adopter of video technologies. Uh, there's been a push over the last decade or so. 
to try as a part of a carbon footprint green initiative to reduce the amount of travel that there is in arbitration, especially in the early stages of arbitration to do with interlocutory hearings, uh, procedural hearings, etc. Uh, whether it, it's just uh, more time efficient and um, from a um, green perspective, a lot more efficient to just hold those by video technologies rather than convening parties from around the world to a particular venue. Um, that said, when it comes to merits hearings, I think we are all sort of in agreement that it tends to work better if everybody is in a room and in person, although I've regularly done merits hearings where at least witnesses have called in via video link. And just there's some statistics there just to, to show actually that um, how commonly it is used within arbitration. So, you know, even last year before the pandemic, 60% uh, of the, the 200 hearings which were heard in ICSID last year uh, were held by video. That said, um, arbitration does have some disadvantages to court litigation. Um, you, the first is about costs. So obviously you have to pay the tribunal's costs. Uh, so it's an extra mouth to feed effectively. However, the, the, the one contrasting point I'd put to that is that um, the LCIA fee for issuing a new arbitration, uh, so for issuing an arbitration is um, 1,700. Oh, sorry, that is Siri going off. Uh, so LCIA fee to issue a new arbitration is 1,750 pounds, whilst uh, you know, um, court fees are, you know, it's 10,000 pounds for a, uh, a dispute over a certain size. Um, so, you know, the, the filing fee is cheap within arbitration. Um, arbitration, it can be slower than court litigation. Um, there's two main reasons for that. One is if you've got a respondent that is just trying to delay the process and you haven't agreed an expedited regime up front, uh, tribunals will tend to bend over backwards to try and help respondents. So it can be seen that they've given them the opportunity to adequately prosecute their defence. And the reason for that is that tribunals, arbitrators are really worried about having their award overturned on enforcement if they've not been seen to give a respondent the chance to have adequate time and the adequate opportunity to prosecute their defence. Uh, the second is actually is the ability to summarily dismiss uh, or dispose of hopeless defences equally to um, hopeless claims as well. Um, it's generally been seen in arbitration that it's been very difficult to, to do that. Um, there is a mechanism within the current LCIA rules which allows for it, but it's not as clear as you have with the, um, the CPR in terms of the way that you summarily dismiss hopeless claims and hopeless defences. And so what the arbitral bodies are starting to do, they've recognised that um, arbitral users want a mechanism to, to deal with this in order to shortcut disputes. And so, for example, SEAC, the Singapore International Arbitration Centre, has already uh, provided a new rule within its rules, which from its case report last year, uh, looks like it's already been used by parties quite substantially and has actually been successful in the majority of circumstances where it has been used. And uh, we're expecting the new updated LCIA rules at any time, uh, supposed to be from autumn last year. I suspect with the pandemic, it might be the autumn this year when they get released. But I think everybody is expecting that there will be a similar rule to now allow for the adequate summary disposal of claims under the new LCIA rules. Um, the final sort of disadvantage is, uh, is about injunctive relief. Um, so under the Arbitration Act 1996, uh, there is a mechanism that you can apply to court in order to get injunctive relief in support of the arbitration. So if you need a freezer or if you need a um, in order to preserve documents, etc., then there's a mechanism there under the Arbitration Act. Um, the a lot of arbitral rules and a lot of arbitral uh, arbitral centres have realised actually that some parties want what they call emergency arbitrators, so the ability to appoint an emergency arbitrator to make similar orders of that kind. The problem is, it, rather than going down to court on an ex parte basis and getting such an order within a day, it can sometimes take between a week or two weeks to get the, um, the award from an emergency arbitrator. Um, and so, so what parties were doing were they were saying, OK, we just won't use the emergency arbitrator route, we'll go down to court. But there's a case called Gerald, Gerald Metals and Timis, 
we said, well, actually, no, uh, you can only come to court if you're unable to get that relief from an arbitral tribunal. And on the basis that there is this new emergency arbitrator regime, you have to go and um, seek that relief from the emergency arbitrator rather than us. So I think most parties, in order to try and um, have the, the flexibility of being able to go and get court-related injunction, especially if they have an LCIA arbitration clause, are now just actually specifying that within their arbitration agreements, are just specifying that you know, for the avoidance of doubt, either party can seek court-related injunctive relief or emergency relief if they need that from the courts. Uh, just very quickly, I'm sort of conscious of time. Um, just on arbitration clauses, uh, I've just put some top tips there just to make sure that those points are covered if you're ever drafting an arbitration clause. Um, most arbitral institutions have got model clauses on their websites um, which can be used. Uh, but, you know, it's, um, it's a fairly sort of easy process to get right once you've done a couple, um, but it's just if you cover those points that I have specified there, then uh, at least there will be a binding arbitration agreement between the parties but again you know, if you're in doubt um, we're more than happy to assist uh, so please do get in contact uh, so really to the, the quarry in terms of sort of the, uh, the the key point of this sort of session is really about you know arbitration in a post-covid and brexit world you know as Simon touched on before I think we're all likely to, um, to see a uptick in disputes um, post-covid as the government schemes come to an end and those of us in the market think that actually there'll not only will be there, there'll be an increase in court litigation but there'll be a increase in arbitration as well and the sort of the principal reasons for that is um, basically the the time it's going to take in order to get justice through the court system uh, I think we've all seen the court closures over Covid in recent weeks so recent months uh, whilst the courts have been trying their best to try and accommodate as many hearings as possible by video and um, telephone technologies, um, the courts have accepted that there are certain cases which are just not suitable to be disposed of in that way. And so once we get back into um, what I call the after time, so when things start to get back to normal and the courts open up, there could be a perfect storm in terms of um, Obviously, the courts have got a finite amount of resources in terms of numbers of judges, numbers of courtrooms. And so there's going to be a backlog of cases to resolve. There's going to be a wave potentially of new cases to come. And so therefore, there's going to be a huge delay for parties to get justice. Uh, just two sort of brief sort of comments on that. So the CIR sort of, uh, had a webinar a couple of weeks ago about mediation and uh, in particular in, uh, adjudication as well. And what they were saying is that they're, saying they're expecting there to be a tsunami of adjudication claims in the construction sector to come once things start to come, calm down post the um, when we start get back, getting back into normal. And what I think they're expecting, if you've got a party that can't pay or disagrees with the adjudication decision, they'll seek to challenge that. And again, that's just going to create further pressure potentially on the court system. Uh, right at the start of the pandemic, uh, some senior judges could see what was going to happen in terms of the court system. And so you had the likes of Lord Neuberger, Lord Phillips, who were both um, former heads of the Supreme Court, sort of pleading for parties to look for alternative means to resolve their disputes in order to try and alleviate some of pressure on the courts. And for those of us that are in the market and are arbitration practitioners, we don't see that there's going to be the same backlogs or bottlenecks in the arbitration system principally because um, we're not confined by the limited resources of the courts. There's a, a wide number of arbitrators that the parties can select from. Um, we're not confined by the number of courtrooms because you can have an arbitration uh, anywhere. The last one I did was in a set of solicitors offices. I've done arbitrations in hotels, at dedicated arbitration centers. Um, equally uh, with the um, arbitrations experience of dealing with interlocutory hearings as well and procedural hearings via video and um, telephone technologies as well. There isn't just going to be that same delay for access to, um, to justice to, for, in order to get justice. Uh, another sort of aspect is confidentiality post-COVID. I suspect that parties who are involved in uh, projects which are arising out of the pandemic may not want those uh, issues to get out into the public domain. And therefore, having the, uh, the the confidentiality aspects of arbitration 
may be of interest to both parties when entering into agree an agreement. Uh, Post-Brexit, uh, I think this is really the most sort of interesting point about where arbitration could come to the aid of parties over court litigation. Um, touched on before about Brussels recast and the fact that that's going to come to an end currently on the 31st of December 2020. And so there isn't going to be a, um, a regime in place for um, to try and automatically enforce UK judgments in Europe and vice versa. Uh, the UK in March had applied to accede to the Lugano Convention. Um, Lugano, it's, it's not as perfect as Brussels recast, um, a particular sort of um, judgments have got to be registered for example first before they can be enforced uh, unlike under Brussels where you can automatically enforce it in a member state. Uh, another significant drawback of Lugano is what we call the Italian torpedo uh, and that's effectively a mechanism uh, under Brussels which prevents a party from breaching a jurisdiction agreement and just issuing claims in another court in order to delay the process whilst that court gets its act together to work out that it hasn't got jurisdiction to hear the dispute. And we call it the Italian torpedo because most commonly parties have issued in Italy, where it's seen that the court process is a lot slower than it would be here. Under Brussels, there's an effective mechanism to deal with that so that the, uh, the court that has um, received the claim um, doesn't bar the court that should have jurisdiction from hearing that claim. But under Lugano, there isn't a significant way, uh, there isn't an effective mechanism to prevent that. Um, whilst the UK has applied to join Lugano, actually the, the EU in May said that actually it might seek to block the UK's accession to Lugano. I don't think it's been resolved yet as to what the position is going to be. Um, it takes three months in order to get through the Lugano application process. So on the basis that we're already in July, uh, I suspect nothing's going to happen over the summer, uh, even if it is the case that we can accede to Lugano, but that only starts moving in November, December. You can already see there's going to be a three month period where into next year where um, things may fall through the cracks. Uh, well, equally, we may not actually join Lugano, in which case we're probably going to have to rely on what's called the Hague Convention 2005. Um, the, the Hague Convention is really limited in scope, only applies to cases where you've got uh, exclusive jurisdiction clauses, uh, and it's not an as effective mechanism as you have under Brussels or Lugano. Given the sort of uncertainty about how we're going to be able to enforce UK judgments in Europe and vice versa post-Brexit, um, there just isn't any such uncertainty for arbitration because the, the EU and EU member states and the UK are signatories to the New York Convention. And so therefore the, the ability to enforce an arbitral award in Europe and vice versa isn't going to be impacted by Brexit. So you know, if you are concerned about the way that you're going to enforce uh, post-Brexit, uh, arbitration may uh, be the answer for parties at the moment. Very finally, uh, just to touch back on my first slide about enforcement, 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 uh, just to make sure that this sort of really builds home uh, as a takeaway for, for people that have attended today. Um, it's just a quick word example of uh, just how we sort of operate in practice. So you know, imagine you're acting for a UK tech developer uh, for a project for a Kuwaiti telecoms company that's got no assets based outside of Kuwait. You know, what DR clause are you going to select? Um, my sort of advice would be stay away from the English court jurisdiction and adopt an arbitration clause and the reason for that is that the Kuwaiti courts won't recognise UK court judgments because it will only recognise foreign judgments if there is sufficient evidence that their own um, judgments would get reciprocal treatment in that jurisdiction. Kuwait, however, is a member of the New York Convention, so therefore uh, there's the ability there to enforce awards within Kuwait. Uh, just very Briefly, before we get on to the, uh, the q and uh, I'd just like to remind you of some upcoming webinars that we have. Uh, so next Wednesday, uh, we have Lino De Lorenzo and Paul Knight from our insolvency team talking about the, uh, the recent Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act. And then on Thursday next week, uh, we have the, uh, the head of international and UK head of IT uh, talking about the recent ECJ decision. Uh, which is effectively held that the EU-US privacy shield is invalid. Um, 
think that impacts anybody that ha handles data, um, regardless of whether it's a transfer between the US and the EU, uh, impacts uh, participants uh, that handle data on a whole. So that should be a fascinating session. And if you'd be interested to book a place and to sign up to the webinars, then you can find that at our website forward slash events. Um, we have the Q and A slide. Sorry, we're we on the feedback now, Simon. Yeah, fantastic. We've uh, well, the, the the previous slide simply said um, questions. So uh, <laughs> let's <laughs> not a very exciting slide. So let's have a look at some of the questions. Um, do force majeure clauses cover foreseeable events uh, if they're drafted to? Yes, they yes they can. Uh, it purely depends on on the wording, and there is case law which has has held that there's no reason why it it shouldn't. So, depending on the wording, the the answer is yes. Um, then the, someone has said, and I think this is in relation to the case example. Presumably, you could only rely on this force majeure clause on the basis of government action. Otherwise, the pandemic wouldn't be covered under the definition. Yes, I, I entirely agree that that's exactly it. There was no specific pandemic wording, though you may have been able to uh, shoehorn it into other things. So, so absolutely, I agree with that. Um, force majeure, if the supplier obligations are suspended pursuant to a force majeure event and the clause makes no provision for the suspension of the other party's payment obligations, must the paying party continue to meet its payment obligations unless the parties uh, negotiate. Um, difficult to say without seeing the, the particular clause in question and understanding the, the particular contract, but if it's a one-sided thing which just says for, you know, say you have to pay a regular monthly amount to the supplier, but during the period of the force majeure event, the supplier uh, has its obligation to deliver stuff being suspended, yes, you could well end up with um, having to make payments. I mean, there, there may be other remedies, but, but that is exactly that sort of question, which is why the, um, the clauses need to be looked at carefully within the particular context of your particular contracts and not just stick in something um, generic. But that, that's a, a plausible, if undesirable, outcome. Question for Mark. Uh, arbitration, do I need to state that it's binding and final for it not to be appealed, save in exceptional circumstances? Yeah, there's a, a couple of questions here, Simon, about, um, in particular, the, the section 68, section 69 of the Arbitration Act about the ability to appeal arbitration awards. And um, so, um, section 68, section 69, there are abilities to appeal on points of law. Uh, if you're concerned about that and actually you don't want parties to have that opportunity, it is right that some arbitral rules already provide for that within its. Uh, systems of rules. So if you've adopted that set of rules and it's uh, a, a provides for that provision, then parties can't appeal on uh, points of law. Uh, similarly, the, the easiest way to deal with that is just to specify that within the arbitration agreement itself that part, both parties have agreed that you can't appeal on um, the basis of issues of uh, law. Um, you can't contract out of uh, the ability to appeal, uh, challenge an award uh, on the basis of manifest error of an arbitrator, for example, if there is a conflict or inherent bias towards the parties. Um, I think just finally, just given the time, uh, there's a, a couple about uh, governing law uh, of an arbitration agreement uh, and the impact that that might have on enforcement. Um, I think it's probably quite important to say effectively within an arbitration agreement there are there can sometimes be three systems of law operating between each other which can be quite complicated so you have the governing law which underlies the that governs the underlying agreement so the obligations between the parties and the way that they are performed and then the arbitration agreement is a separate agreement within itself even though it's within the same contract and you can effectively have a situation where the law which governs the arbitration agreement can be different from that under the underlying contract. But you can also have a where the curial law that governs the procedure of the arbitration can even be different from that which governs the arbitration clause. Uh, there's a recent case called Chubb and Enker, where Lord Justice Popperwell has tried to once and for all uh, wade through the conflicting authorities on this. 
to define a definitive test as to how you determine uh, those issues. Uh, it's something which is academically fascinating for arbitration lawyers, but in practice, it's quite rare for there to be an issue. Uh, I hope that sort of answers most of the questions, just given the sort of the time that's available. 